This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin tonight with a tragedy in Clarenville. People across the province and the country are posting tributes for a 10 year old boy who died in the town on Christmas Day. Here and Now's Malone Mullen was in Clarenville today and has this report. They appeared overnight. Just as families across the province were tucking into Christmas dinner, the hockey community in Clarenville was decorating their doorsteps with hockey sticks like these a fitting tribute for the 10 year old boy they'd lost just hours earlier. My condolences uh, to the family. Uh, uh, the town is grief stricken right now and we have to, uh, to find ways to, uh, to help them as they deal with this uh, uh, tragedy today and certainly as they, uh, as they move forward. It could be any pond in Canada, the same one that you or I might have skated on as kids. And it was here where the boy and his father came to clear the ice with an ATV. It's a small body of water that uh, everybody uses and kids have been there skating and so on. On the first push, the ice cracked, plunging them both into the water. A dozen bystanders and 20 first responders then helped pull the machine back to shore using ropes and bare hands. Low water level there and uh, I don't think anybody suspected uh, that this could be a potential danger uh, in the winter. What started out to be a, a gathering uh, with a dad and a little boy to go to a uh, patch of ice uh, turned out to be an unfortunate uh, tragedy. When the town heard of the loss, some families signaled their solidarity with sticks outside their doors. The town's minor hockey association pitched in and the tribute snowballed across the province, across the country and even across borders. The hockey family is not only here in Clarenville, it's in the province, it's in our country and even internationally. What you have here now is a, a, a devastated uh, family and you also of course have a, a, a grief stricken uh, group of young people. This uh, boy was a, uh, a member of soccer team here in Clarenville, the hockey team and so on and of course the, the school family is, as well so it's, uh, it's a, a big loss. The boys' elementary school opened its doors to classmates on Boxing Day, but for now, all remains quiet as the community grieves a tragic loss on what should have been a joyous day. Malone Mullen, CBC News, Clarenville. Well, 75 travelers were stranded on the West Coast on Christmas Day when their WestJet flight from Toronto to St. John's was diverted to Deer Lake. Well, the Salvation Army heard and leapt into action to welcome those who came from away. It was the best Christmas day I've ever celebrated. They were taken off the flight, taking, taken to the Holiday Inn Express where they were given breakfast, but that was it. So I made some phone calls and then I went on Facebook. Within 45 minutes, the dining room at the hotel was just packed with food. When we finished eating, they said, as soon as you're ready, let us know and we'll take you to the airport. So my wife and I got our bags and came out to the front of the hotel to find a long line of cars all lined up to, to ferry people back. People said, this is like another come from away. So I said, yeah, I named it come from away Christmas day. We were missing our families and realizing we weren't getting home for Christmas day. They saw people in need who couldn't look out for themselves that day and uh, they stepped up. I'm just so satisfied that they're all in St. John's and, and they're having their Christmas day today. Oh yeah, we did have a, a little bit of some winter weather, which is why those flights were diverted a little bit earlier. I uh, did see a little bit of a break in the weather today, but as we head through uh, the next, or at least through the weekend, we've got snow on the way for Saturday, flurries and windy, windy conditions expected on Sunday. Those winds are going to continue as we head through the day on Monday as well. I'll tell you how much is on the way coming up. Thanks, Ashley. A close call for a St. John's man on Christmas Day when a plow pummeled his house and sent snow and ice flying through his living room. 
This window in Roy Evans' home was shattered Wednesday. Evans lives at a busy intersection on Thorburn Road and Goldstone Street. He was finally able to reach city staff today and was told someone will be by to assess the damage. But he says that's not enough and worries what could have happened if he or his upstairs tenant had been standing in the plow's path. As you can see, this is where the uh, slosh came through. This is where it came down the road. So this is an ongoing thing this year's with me. So we'll like, get something done with it. I think I no one got hurt. Well, after a harrowing 1,000 kilometer journey, 37 cats who once roamed Notre Dame Bay are now looking for new homes in Nova Scotia. The cats came from Little Bay Islands, where, as we've been covering on here and now, 54 residents are relocating at the end of the month. Volunteers with Spay Day HRM in Halifax rescued the animals. Most of the cats are in good health, largely because residents fed and socialized them. Tracy Galusha was one of the volunteers who drove round trip through harsh weather from Dartmouth to Notre Dame Bay. A lot of them aren't really afraid of humans like the normal feral cats would be because nobody was mean to them there. Um, they all weren't handled. So, you know, a lot of them will go to the barn program, but um, a lot of them will be adopted too. Volunteers are now preparing to rehome the cats. Some of the friendlier felines will soon be available for adoption through the SPCA, while others, as you just heard, will be rehomed to barns. Well, the province's technology startup industry went gangbusters in 2019. One St. John's-based software company inked a deal worth more than half a billion dollars. Others received millions more. Even local incubator spaces were internationally recognized this year. Here and now's Katie Breen has this look back at the wildly successful year that was. Verifin is the dream. The company has achieved the level of success other up-and-coming tech entrepreneurs aspire to reach. This year, it signed the largest venture capital deal in Canadian history, worth $515 million. And it did that from its offices in St. John's. We've been able to build something really special here, and I think um, it's a testament to the fact that you can do this here. The company fights financial crime using artificial intelligence. More than 3,000 banks in Canada and the U.S. use its software to detect fraud and money laundering. It's a profitable and growing business. Verifin makes $100 million in annual reoccurring revenue. It has more than 500 employees. They hired 150 people this year and plan to do the same in 2020. It's the benchmark. I would like us to see 10 Verifin scale companies here in Newfoundland. I think that's a number that a lot of us in the community are saying. <laughs> Misa is following Verifin's lead, looking to anchor and grow its smart thermostat business in St. John's. This year, the Canadian Innovation Exchange named Misa one of the country's top 20 early stage startups, and that was before it launched its second invention. So this is really exciting. This is our new product. Building on our baseboard technology, we've built a smart thermostat for electric in-floor heating. So just like our, our Mesa smart thermostat for baseboards, you can now control your in-floor heating system from your phone, be able to set really easy, energy-efficient schedules. In May, Mesa raised $2.3 million from investors based in the province and in other parts of Canada. The company went from having 30 staff to 52 and just hired a recruiter to bring in even more people next year. Call us and busy. Steady growth is a trend. Colab Software, another startup, is looking to double its 22-person staff next year. It just moved into this bigger space to make room. The business helps digitize the engineering design process. Co-founder Adam Keating spent this past summer in Silicon Valley. Colab was the first Atlantic Canadian company ever accepted into Y Combinator, an exclusive three-month program designed to mentor startups and help them refine their pitches. He left with a $2.7 million investment and new California-based backers. We're at a place where we just released Colab 2.0, it was a huge product milestone for us. Um, and over the next year, I think we're going to see that we start to set kind of the industry standard for engineering collaboration globally. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's awesome. Thank you all for being here, uh, and we're, we're hiring. Company founders see tech as the best way forward the clearest way to diversify the province's economy. 
the 23-year-old behind Breathe Suite, a device that teaches people how to properly use inhalers, gives credit to the network of people and organizations in the startup community, helping him and the other newer entrepreneurs get off the ground. He announced a $550,000 investment two months ago. And weeks later... We were actually supported at every step of the way, from the inception of our business uh, to where we are now. Another announcement. Three quarters of a million dollars for legal software business, Rally. Money from private investors inside and outside of the province. Rally, which is also hiring, is headquartered at Genesis, inside Mun Signal Hill campus. Genesis mentors up-and-coming businesses. It's where Verifin got its start. And this year, at the World Incubation Summit in Doha, Qatar, it was recognized as one of the best in North America. The Memorial Center for Entrepreneurship was also celebrated on the international stage. It was named one of the top five emerging entrepreneurship centers in the world. MCE helps students from the idea stage. It's only three and a half years old, but it can already count MISA, Colab, and Breathe Suite as alumni. There is a very strong pipeline coming up, so be careful because 2020 is going to be awesome too. The industry wants to build on the momentum, and startup founders say it's possible. Investors are impressed by the caliber of companies coming out of Newfoundland and Labrador, and new entrepreneurs are ready to put in the work. There's no reason that this can't be done here. We just need to be able to support the businesses that are here and support that idea of entrepreneurship, and certainly we can create 10 more uh, verifins. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it's the day after Boxing Day, a traditional British holiday that's often misunderstood. And for those of you who aren't sick of shopping, it's also the start of many Boxing Day sales. Well, back in 1993, reporter Russell Wangerski headed to the Village Mall to ask shoppers how Boxing Day got its start. So why is it called Boxing Day anyway? This can't be what it's all about. Basically, how much boxing gear do you sell on Boxing Day? Well, to go with history, not a big lot. I guarantee you. Perhaps it should be called after Christmas Sales Day. The parking lot at the mall is packed. And inside, the place is papered with sales as merchants try for one last bite from the Christmas turkey. So far, sales are brisk, though the congestion is not up to the pre-Christmas standards. But what about the real issue here? Why is it called Boxing Day? I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> Boxing Day means uh, a holiday. Obviously, it's no holiday today, but no, I'm not sure what the meaning of it is. Okay. Yep. Finally, we get a little closer. Uh, the church used to have a box on Christmas Day in the... Uh, in the church, and after Christmas Day, they would give out what was in the box to the poor people. So that's why it's called Boxing Day. Aristocracy used to give their gifts to their servants on the day after Christmas, and they traditionally gave them in boxes. And they would never give them, like, you know, today's idea of gift wrapping, it was always in boxes. So that's the reason it's called Boxing Day. I was just curious. That's almost the truth. The English tradition of giving gifts to the poor on St. Stephen's Day led to the exchange of boxed gifts and finally, to the shopping festival we celebrate today. For CBC News, I'm Russell Wongerski in St. John's. Every boat owner, they're so proud of their boats and they're giving back to the community. They're giving back to anybody that comes here. All the boats in Port de Grave are docked and on display. We'll head to the harbor with the most holiday spirit next.
Welcome back, everyone. And uh, we we're just chatting over the break. Ashley, this was your first Christmas in Newfoundland away from home. How was it? It was. It was lovely, especially with uh, all that snow. Mm -hmm. Really put you. Gorgeous. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah. Well, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope all the Canada Post workers had a good holiday as well because they've been working pretty hard. Yep. <laughs> and sure especially have. this guy, a Canada Post worker in Grand Falls, Windsor, donned a Santa suit, even dyed his beard. He does that every Christmas. Yeah, Annette White says that Roy Shepard has such a big heart and Christmas spirit and the kids are amazed and love it when they see him. How awesome is that? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so great. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, you know, all that snow that we were talking about the uh, for Christmas. Look at, these are some of the totals. So this is since Christmas Eve. We had a couple of rounds, one on Boxing Day as well. That brought the totals up to 38 centimeters for Mount Pearl. They take the uh, most St. John's 35 centimeters then a number of areas sitting in the 30 centimeter mark. We're going to add to that as we head through the next couple of days, but the winds won't be as strong. Certainly not tomorrow. Uh, they will pick up as we head through the next couple of days, but here's what we saw. Top gust was Bonavista, 106 kilometers per hour and a number of areas. St. John's at 87 kilometers per hour for those winds. Certainly strong last night. Uh, temperatures today, pretty nice, hovering around the zero degree mark for St. John's, minus three for Deer Lake. Uh, chilly temperatures up through Labrador, minus 12 for Churchill Falls, Makovic sitting at the same temperature. And uh, we're going to see a little bit of a drop in those temperatures as we head through the night tonight. Not a whole lot happening weather wise, though, across the board. We are seeing some cloud cover spread across the big land and making its way towards the island as well. That's actually going to bring some snow with it. So we're going to start to see that snow uh, already seeing it for parts of Lab West. That's going to spread towards the west coast of Newfoundland as we head into uh, the early morning hours uh, and then it's going to continue to spread east as we head towards the morning for the island and tapering to basically flurries for parts of central Labrador. So here's where you're going to sit overnight. The winds are going to ease. Uh, for the island, minus 7 degrees will be the low for St. John's. Double digit lows, minus 13 for Grand Falls, Windsor. And that's because we should actually see some partly cloudy skies tonight with those winds easing. Minus 12 for Lab City, again with flurries continuing. And then you'll see that for Happy Valley Goose Bay as well. Coastal areas are going to stay partly to mostly cloudy through the night sitting in the minus uh, double digits. So tomorrow that snow is going to stick around uh, through the day for most of the island, even southeastern portions of uh, Labrador. We'll see a few flurries. Otherwise, not a whole lot happening up through the big land. That snow is going to generally continue. But like I said, the winds really won't play uh, a role in tomorrow's weather for sure. So here's tomorrow morning. You'll see probably about or potentially upwards of five to 10 centimeters of snow by tomorrow morning along the south coast. Uh, otherwise, it's a trace to five centimeters, especially up through Labrador and then through the day tomorrow as that snow continues to spread a little bit further east. Good chance you could pick up anywhere from five to 10 centimeters for most pockets of 10 to 15 more than likely in those higher elevations, especially uh, for the southwestern portion of the island. So here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise. Not much movement from the temperature today sitting and hovering around the zero degree mark, maybe a little bit below for Clarenville, Marystown and really anywhere along the south or southern portion of the Avalon could see some rain mixed in with this snow tomorrow probably bringing those amounts down a little bit. Uh, but overall, again, five to 10 centimeters is possible. Heading towards central, minus one, minus two through the day. Again, winds not very strong. They'll pick up a little bit in the evening, though, 20 to 30 kilometers per hour out of the west. But overall, we're just hovering just a little bit below zero. Mary's Harbor, minus eight tomorrow. Winds generally light. And then Lab City, you're going to be sitting around minus 11 as well. So that's your Saturday forecast. As we head into Sunday, that's when those winds will really ramp up. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, a visitation is being held tonight for one of the province's most elite fishermen. Lindsay Petten died Monday while scuba diving in the waters off Bear Need near Bay Roberts. The 46-year-old was diving with his son. The pair was searching for wild scallops and mussels when Petten went unconscious. He leaves behind a wife and three children. A visitation is being held tonight in Port de Grave, where the Petten name is synonymous with the fishery. A celebration of life service will be held tomorrow afternoon at the Pentecostal Tabernacle at 2 o'clock. 
Well, for 20 years, Lindsay Petten's hometown has been decking the decks during the Christmas season. Port de Grave puts on a marine spectacle of lights that attracts tens of thousands throughout the holidays. The CBC's Chris O'Neill Yates was there. The fishing season behind them, the boats of Port de Grave are tied up. As evening sets in, they light up. It's crazy. Some of these boats probably got up to 5,000 lights. Many Newfoundland fishing communities have been down on their luck, but Port de Grave is prosperous. Fishermen have done well here, fishing shrimp and crab. It's that spirit of gratitude for their good fortune that drives this event, says Joyce Morgan, who's been at the helm since the beginning. Every boat owner, they're so proud of their boats and they're giving back to the community. They're giving back to anybody that comes here. It all began with a string of lights on one boat 20 years ago. Now there is all this, and people come from all over just to experience a little bit of nautical Christmas spirit. Paulstead is one of about 30,000 people who make the trip here this holiday season. It's great, I think, and it's probably been 10 years since I said I was going to come out, so I finally got here. No detail has been left out. Some familiar characters and a lot of creativity. Gear used to haul the daily catches, repurposed to bring festive joy. I think it's gorgeous and it's quite a community effort to uh, achieve such a great, great Christmas in this, in this little uh, community, right? It brings out the Christmas spirit yeah. and to come down and see what people, people will go through just to get people to come and to see their, see their community. The numbers of decorated boats here has grown every year. This year, 68 are showing their true Christmas colors. It's unbelievable. We never thought that back in 1999 that we would be here today, and it's getting better, bigger and better every year. The fish landed. Now it's visitors the community is reeling in to see the little and not so little boats of Newfoundland light up a cold winter's night. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Port de Grave, Newfoundland. I did the whole thing without falling. <laughs> well, new Canadian children are trying out a new sport. The hope is hockey will make them feel more included. We'll check out the program and hit the ice after the break.
Welcome back. Governor General Julie Payette today released her annual New Year's message. In it, she praises Canadians for their international contributions and pays tribute to the country's Indigenous people. Whether you were born here or chose to come and live here, whether you're just passing through or came here to seek refuge, this is your country, a land of breathtaking beauty that deserves to be explored and celebrated. Rain, snow or shine. For we are so fortunate. We share values and interests. We can be proud of our diversity and we are recognized around the world as open, curious, team players, peace seekers, peacekeepers. And we are accomplished like the indigenous people who have been living here on this ancestral land for thousands of years. Those who taught us to survive in the cold, to appreciate the gift of nature and the importance of community. I have seen it everywhere I have been this year. Canadians are out there making a difference as artists, scientists, athletes, entrepreneurs. Young or old, every one of us is an ambassador. Well, a popular Inuk singer-songwriter has died at the age of 26. Kelly Frazier made a name for herself with music that blended folk, pop, hip-hop, and electronic dance with politically charged lyrics. Frazier gained popularity back in 2013. That's when her version of Rihanna's song Diamonds, sung in Inuktitut, became a YouTube sensation. More recently, she was crowdsourcing her third album, which she planned to release in the spring. The cause of her sudden death earlier this week has not been made public. Well, hundreds of children are getting the gift of belonging this holiday season, and they're getting it where so many memories are made in this country, on the ice. CBC's Katie Nicholson tells us about a remarkable program and the man behind it. The path to becoming Canadian can be a little slippery. But these kids are getting a helping hand and a crash course on how to play Canada's game. All in the name of helping new Canadians develop a better sense of belonging. Moazine Hisham started Hockey for Youth four years ago. My parents came to Canada in 1972 from Uganda and I was born in Vancouver. Uh, I was given my first set of hockey equipment by our neighbour who still lives across the street from my mum and they said you should put your youngest son into hockey and my parents obliged and it gave me an opportunity to feel socially included. We're also going to do some turning today. He's now extending that opportunity to hundreds of other kids from 30 countries who also just want to belong. What you want to do is make sure you put more of an emphasis on your rotating your ankle. So you Keelan Farron volunteers with Hockey for Youth. I grew up kind of part Indian and part Scottish. There you go, and then you cross over just like that. Yeah. But it's hockey that has played a key part in Farron's Canadian identity. Definitely, I think of like winter days where you kind of go on the pond in the backyard. You're kind of just always outside in the snow and skating. I think hockey is just something that I see myself as when I say, I'm Keelan, I'm a hockey player. <laughs> Farron and the rest of the Ryerson Rams women's hockey team provide a steady hand to guide the kids. Yeah. I did the whole thing without falling. The whole thing. Hockey belongs to everyone. It's not just people who can know how to play the sport, but people who want to watch a sport, who maybe want to get involved in the sport. I think it just extends further than just playing the game and just growing, it to, growing to love the game. <laughs> You're ready. And it appears to be working. Gaurav Akram is from India, where field hockey is big, ice hockey, not so much. Skating on ice is was. But he's learning. In future, also a chance to play hockey, or like join it. You want them tighter? Just let me know. Cool. And that's exactly what Muazin yeah. Hisham wants to hear. It's pretty emotional in a positive way. I think about the kids who, um, you know, some of the some of the things that they've gone through. Um, but every time they're out on the ice, 
you get to see those smiles. You, when they fall for the first time, it's amazing to see them get back up. And that's what we talk about all the time is when you fall, you get back up and you try again. Hey, buddy. And for Hashem, this program is deeply personal. For me, I always tell my mom and my dad that it's, it's kind of a full circle experience in terms of they put me into hockey and now I'm using the game to give back. There you go. And as the program expands into a third city, it's a gift that keeps on giving the gift of hockey and belonging. Okay, so all the way, follow me, follow me, let's go. Right, let's go. Go, 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 go. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. Well, most celebrate the festive season at the end of the year, but in some parts of British Columbia, the season starts in July. That's because the province is a popular destination for those cheesy Hallmark Christmas movies. CBC's Tina Lovegreen takes us to a movie set in a town transformed. It's Christmas time in East Riverton. Well, actually, we're in Steveston, BC, where the latest Hallmark Christmas movie is being shot. Oh, I love the Christmas scenes, everything about it. They may not tell the audience they're in BC, but this is the go-to place to film them. Filming starts in the summer and goes until mid-November, and to transform the village of Steveson to bring that holiday spirit, it takes a lot of decorations and fish ice. That's right, fish ice. Steveston is one of BC's most famed fishing communities. Crews routinely check fishing docks for shaved ice to turn sets into a winter wonderland. It's really fun to see. I think everyone loves Christmas, so we just enjoy the moment. These movies are big business. This year alone, Hallmark pumped out 24 new holiday flicks, a record. And the price is right for Hallmark to film here in Canada. There's no question that tax credits are a big part of it, and also the, the dollar, the exchange on the dollar. For every Canadian hired, there is a tax break. But BC tops the list for places to shoot because it's really easy to dress up. Because of the, the scenery, because of the access to the, uh, the gear. We have a fully evolved and a fully developed system for making films and television. The turnaround on production for these movies is quick. 
And if you've ever watched a Hallmark Christmas movie, you know they're as cheesy as their titles. You know you're always going to get a happy ending. Which is part of the appeal, says this pop culture columnist. We have low expectations at this time of year. You know, um, people just want something that's easy to watch. But missing almost entirely from Hallmark's festive roster is diversity. Their casts are whiter than all that fake snow in those movies. There has never been an LGBTQ romance in any of their holiday films. They're strictly hetero, which is kind of shocking in this day and age. Would pick Zola to have and to host. And that's not lost on anyone, especially after the backlash the channel faced for pulling this commercial. Do you think Zola could have made planning your perfect wedding easier? After complaints from a conservative group. It reinstated the ad after widespread outrage and calls for a boycott. But by then it became hard to ignore the tarnish on a perfect Christmas image, even one that's made in B.C. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Richmond. Well, every town has a secret place and Mount Pearl is no different. For instance, most residents there don't know anything about a small swimming hole that holds memories for generations of swimmers. And our special neighborhood feature here and now takes you to warmer times in Mount Pearl. Hi, I'm Pat O'Keefe and we're Twin Falls in Mount Pearl. I grew up in the 40s and 50s as a kid. and we, I lived in the West End of St. John's in the Hamilton Avenue area. We used to come in here swimming. The first time I was here, I was with my uh, older sister. And uh, uh, one of the things that day, she brought a tin of beans with her. One thing she forgot was the can opener. And uh, she put the beans on the fire. Next thing we had an explosion, beans gone everywhere, right? But it was uh, always, always a beautiful spot. And it was always, never left my mind growing up or anything. I always, I always cherished uh, the fun we used to have at Twin Falls. The big thing I find right now, I mean, like the bridge going across, so that wasn't there. I mean, it was it was strictly wilderness when we were kids growing up here. Going up uh, where Park Avenue is now, there was cabins up there, and, and when you went up further, actually across from where I lived on a small drive, O'Keefe Avenue, going over there, there was cabins over there, right? To us, it was country. It was going in country, right? And, and, and that's, that's, where, that's where we looked at it, and, uh, you know, Never they ever dreamed that you'd ever come here to live in here in Mount Pearl, right? And it quickly grew. When I moved on Smallwood Drive, Smallwood Drive has just been developed then, right? I, I guess some of the greatest memories I got is, you know, just ser serving in Mount Pearl, like coaching kids in, uh, in soccer and hockey and this type of thing. And that's uh, growing up with, with young people. You know, it tends to keep you young as well, right? The uh, sports part of it, I mean, when we built Smallwood Drive Arena, the, tin can, the old tin can, we were all part of that at the time, and uh, it, uh, it certainly developed some great hockey players, and uh, we made it a point almost every year that our competitive teams traveled to the mainland every, every year. We were always competitive with these teams that we went and played, right? So, which made it certainly competitive here in Newfoundland as well, right? I think Mount Pearl is a, is a great spot. It's a great spot to rear your family. It's a great spot. To, everything is so close, you know, like you can, you can jump in your car in five minutes, you're, you, you have everything, your shop and your schools, your churches, everything, you know? I think Mount Pearl is, uh, to me, is the most beautiful spot in the world. And I, I wouldn't, like I always say, they carry me out of here in a wooden box, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's the only way I'm moving out of Mount Pearl, right?
Welcome back, everyone. Well, the weekend's here. <laughs> That's quite Feels okay. kind of weird. It's hard to remember what day of the week it is it right is, now. Especially during the Christmas holidays. It definitely yeah. is. What day is it today? Yeah, it's no. It's Friday. It's oh, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that means we're going to start talking about Sunday's forecast. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, winds are going to pick up. So let's take a, a look at what the future tracker is saying as far as snowfall goes. We should actually see that snow continue uh, flurries, maybe some light snow uh, along the northeast mainly is where we should see the majority of the accumulation could pick up another two to as much as five centimeters of snow bringing some of those accumulations for the weekend again especially along the northeast upwards of maybe 10 to 15 centimeters of snow but again those winds are going to ramp up it's pretty much the same situation as we had christmas eve into christmas day where that low heads offshore and intensifies so there'll be northerly winds for the most part and uh, that will continue into the first half of monday as well so here's a look at the uh, temperatures hovering around the zero degree mark. So really not moving much as far as temperatures go over the next couple of days. Minus three for Corner Brook, same for the Strait. Uh, minus seven for Happy Valley Goose Bay. The coolest temperatures will be for Lab West. You'll be sitting around minus 14 through the day on Sunday. And then uh, relatively mild for Cartwright, only hovering around the minus two uh, degree range. But again, we're going to see those windy conditions. Now the snow will more than likely stick around through the day on Monday as well, at least through the first half of the day. That'll move off. Tuesday actually looks pretty quiet, which is New Year's Eve, and then the next system will move in. Timing on this one a little bit off as well as uh, just where this system will track. So it does look like it will be snow, but depending on how far this low moves, it could see some uh, rain change over to rain and or some freezing rain associated with this one as well. So we'll certainly keep an eye on that forecast over the coming days. But here's a look at your forecast over the next five days for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Again, windy both Sunday and Monday. Tuesday, those winds should ease a little bit, but still hanging on to that chance of uh, some scattered flurries. And then same thing for Wednesday or New Year's Day. Some flurries, but those temperatures hovering around the zero degree mark, maybe just a little bit below. Your overnight low is not moving much either. So uh, for central Newfoundland, it does look like sunshine for New Year's Eve. And then the chance of uh, flurries will move back in for Wednesday, sitting around minus two. Again, a little bit uh, need to nail out that forecast there a little bit as far as uh, if we see a warm up. Same thing for Western Newfoundland, uh, sitting around minus three for Wednesday. Looks like plenty of sunshine for both Monday to or all Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday for Eastern Labrador. So a little bit of some quiet weather on tap. And then for Western Labrador, we're looking at a uh, minus 16 for Monday. Overnight lows dipping again into the minus 20s. New Year's Day, uh, New Year's Eve looks pretty nice. Minus 15 with some cloudy periods. And then Wednesday is when the chance of flurries returns and minus 11. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have a pretty nice weather photo coming up. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, in 2011, the St. John's Morning Show held its annual Gift of Song contest. The crew headed to Tiffany Lane for a musical surprise for Otto Tucker. But as it turned out, Mr. Tucker had a little surprise of his own. Here's the CBC's Chrissy Holmes. Inside the lobby at Tiffany Lane, Brian Vardy is anxiously awaiting his dear old friend for what he thinks will be a regular coffee get together. But his nominee has no idea what else is waiting for him downstairs. He was my professor uh, when I uh, did my internship in Harlow in 1977. When he was only 19 years old, he went there as a teacher and a lieutenant with the, with the uh, Salvation Army. So he's had a history in Newfoundland and uh, he's failing a little bit and I thought it would be only just and, and important to uh, to give him a boost and uh, he's going to be so pleased. He, he won't be able to believe it, I'm sure. Dr. Otto Tucker, a recipient of the Order of Canada and the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador. Born in 1923, Dr. Tucker has churned his 88 years into countless stories and still openly shares his lessons and experiences with anyone who will listen. Dr. Tucker is visually impaired and has trouble hearing. Dr. Tucker, Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, we're surrounded by a lot of smiling faces here at Tiffany uh, Lane. So would you like to hear a song from our carolers? Oh, I love that. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. As luck would have it, Silent Night happens to be Dr. Tucker's very favorite song. 
I'm lost for words. <laughs> if I didn't know those few words, I'd be silent. <laughs> so when the time came for the carolers to sing Dr. Tucker's second song, Tucker had another idea. Want me to sing one? You want to sing along? What are you going to sing, girls? Joy to the world. Joy to the world. All right, let's do well, it. Let me sing uh, Silent Night with them again. You want to do Silent Night again? Yeah. All right, sure. Go ahead, girl. Sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night. Shepherds quake at the sight. It's too bad that we don't carry this through in our lives with every association we have, hey? We don't need only Christmas to pour out our love and our concern and our compassion to other human beings. Jesus, Lord of thy birth. <laughs> Holmes, CBC News, St. John's. Here's a look at a beautiful weather photo. A little, lot of stuff happening <laughs> in that shot. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back. What warms your heart at Christmas time? My family and my friends. Seeing it all through their eyes is, is the most heartwarming for me. Christmas includes everybody and that's what's important. It's just, you know, everybody feels the, the warmth of the season. What'd you say? Thank you. You're welcome. Merry Christmas.
Time to find out who's celebrating. Happy anniversary to Bob and Pat Taylor of Cornerbrook. They celebrate their 50th anniversary on Sunday. Jack and Marie Duffett of Trinity Bay, now living in St. John's, will celebrate 60 years of marriage on Sunday. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Tony and Rosalind Noble, who celebrated their special day on the 23rd. Hazel and Albert Peach from Corner Brook celebrated their 64th anniversary on December 21st. Happy birthday to Jim Lamb in St. John's, who celebrated his 90th birthday on the 23rd. Happy anniversary to Lillian and Boyce Tucker of CBS. They celebrated their 60th anniversary on Sunday. Best wishes to Bud and Donna Osmond from Twillingate. Their 50th wedding anniversary was yesterday. Tertius Piercy in Cornerbrook celebrated his 95th birthday on the 22nd. Happy birthday. And congratulations to Bill and Marina Hiscock of Winterton, who celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary on the 23rd. Love from family and friends. Happy 63rd anniversary to Donald and Juanita Mullins of Lack, uh, Lark Harbor, rather. Congratulations. Best wishes to George and Gert Power of St. Lawrence. They're celebrating 50 years of marriage. Happy 91st birthday to Mamie Colburn from Lush's Bite, now living in Springdale. Happy 56th wedding anniversary to Rose and John Bragg of Grand Falls, Windsor. They were married on Christmas Eve. Michael and Terry Leonard from St. John celebrated their 50th anniversary on December 26th. Congratulations. Grace and Frank Williams of Pools Cove celebrated 57 years of marriage on the 24th. Anniversary greetings to Harold and Marianne McGraw of St. John's. They celebrate 56 years tomorrow. Happy anniversary to Claude and Lena Johnson of Labrador City. They celebrate their 60th anniversary on Sunday. Happy 62nd wedding anniversary to Sarah and Clooney Hounsel. Love from family and friends. And happy birthday to Laura Comden, who celebrated her 92nd birthday on the 24th. Happy 60th wedding anniversary greetings going out to Frank and Mary Gale of Stephenville. Happy anniversary to Ada and George Walters of Trinity, Trinity Bay, who celebrate 54 years of marriage tomorrow. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Clarence and Mona Decker of Pasadena. 61st anniversary greetings to Clarence and Mavis King of Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 52nd anniversary to Bert and Betty Quigley of Deer Lake. Birthday greetings going out to Frank Gale of Stephenville, who's celebrating his 90th birthday on December 31st. Congratulations to Elvin and Mildred Tucker of St. John's. Their 57th anniversary is this Sunday. Happy 50th anniversary to Cliff and Irma Bull in Sandringham. And another golden anniversary. Happy 50th to Alan and Betty Billard of Carbonier. Best wishes to Joshua and Sarah Young of Burgio, now living in Mount Pearl. They celebrating, or they are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Happy 53rd wedding anniversary tomorrow to Thomas and Marjorie Thorne from Trinity Bay. Wishing Millicent and Ambrose Penton a happy 61st anniversary. They're from Fogo Island and are now living in Stephenville. Happy 50th anniversary on Sunday to Bernice and Ed Dalton, love from family and friends. Wishing Reverend Boyce and Olive Parsons from Lumsden a happy 55th wedding anniversary. Happy 51st wedding anniversary to Oswald and Sadie Brown from Summerford. Happy 64th anniversary to Iris and Roy Stoyles of Glenwood. Congratulations to David and Barbara Adams, originally from Toronto and Cape Onion, now living in St. John's. They're celebrating 50 years of marriage. Happy 65th anniversary tomorrow to Ray and Geneva Reed of Dildo. And happy 57th anniversary today to Cal and Vera Wells of Fogo, Fogo Island. Congratulations and best wishes to Dan and Ann Kelly of Marystown, who are celebrating 64 years of marriage today. Happy 55th wedding anniversary tomorrow to Marie and Dan Foley of Tilting Fogo Island. Mary Jane Hopkins of Southbrook is celebrating her 91st birthday today. Happy birthday. And birthday greetings going out to Jesse Collins, whose 96th birthday is tomorrow. Jesse is from Indian Islands, Notre Dame Bay, and is now living in St. John's. Happy 91st birthday to Susanna Pretty in St. John's. Love from all your family and friends.
Another fine crowd. Congratulations, mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. Take a look at our weather photo yeah. for today. A nice shot there. I uh, just love this photo. Gorgeous. I, I thought it was great. Yeah, so this one was taken actually on the Port of Port Peninsula uh, for Boss Wallows. Beach. Beach. Isn't that nice, sir? It's gorgeous. Yeah, a gorgeous <laughs> shot there. Thank you so much. They're actually hunting for some sea glass. Okay. So Jenny sent us that uh, that wonderful shot. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cpc.ca. Just beautiful. Love it. Thank I'm going to go do that much. one day. Yeah. <laughs> sea glass is wonderful. So what is sea glass? It's, I feel like I should know what it is. But I, don't, I actually don't know what it is. I just know that it's beautiful. Okay, someone's going to tell us for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Figure it out. Have a great weekend, everyone. Good night. Good night.